Hi everyone, I'm Rupert Goff. Today we're looking at what you need as a deposit for a house in 2022. But first, don't forget to click on the like button and hit subscribe so you can get all our latest mortgage education videos. There are essentially two things you need to have when buying a house. Income to pay the mortgage and an adequate deposit for the bank. The amount of income varies vastly and it's actually quite a hard number to nail down. The amount varies from bank to bank and is also highly variable depending on your monthly expenses, how many children you have and your secondary debt, things like credit cards for instance. Your deposit on the other hand is a considerably easier answer to get your hands on. Well, sort of. As a general rule, a 20% deposit is classed as good. For example, if you are buying a house for a million dollars and you happen to have $200,000 available to use as a deposit, then the bank will tend to be fairly happy with your application. Now, if you don't have a 20% deposit, don't close this video. I'm going to go into all your other options very soon. And at the end of the video, I'm going to tell you how it may be possible to purchase with as little as 5% deposit. But before I do, I want to go into a bit more about what constitutes a deposit. Obviously, savings in your bank account counts towards a deposit. KiwiSaver also counts as long as you are able to access it, for example, as a first home buyer. Anything you can liquidate to put down at the time of purchase is okay too. Shares, cryptocurrency, etc. If you can sell it and use it towards the purchase of your home, it can count as a deposit. As a side note here, if you do have something like cryptocurrency or even overseas money which can fluctuate in value significantly, it's worth converting it into New Zealand dollars at the time of application. It might seem early, but at least you know that if you have promised the bank $50,000 of cash, it's there in your account. Bad things happen if you go to sell your Bitcoin and they only turn out to be worth, say, $40,000. Fortunately, Money from the bank of mum and dad is also counted towards your deposit. You may have $100,000 of savings and your parents may be pitching in another $100,000. The bank would rightly view this as a $200,000 deposit. A couple of caveats though. As a general rule, banks like you to have personally saved 5% of the purchase price. In other words, your parents can't just give you the whole deposit. On a million dollar purchase, banks would prefer to see you with $50,000 saved in cash or KiwiSaver and the rest can be from the family. The second caveat is that if the money from mum and dad is a loan with regular payments required, then those loan payments will be taken out of your income when the bank comes to assess it. It's okay if it's a long-term loan with no regular payments required, that's completely acceptable. Just keep an eye on your income affordability if you need to pay them back over time. Okay, for a lot of people, a 20% deposit won't be achievable. So what can you do if you have less than 20% deposit? Banks do have the ability to lend a certain amount of their money to what is termed low deposit borrowers. In other words, less than 20%. Most banks can lend to people with as little as 10% deposit. But again, if you're using mum and dad for help, you're likely to still need to have saved 5% yourself. The problem is, the amount of money that banks have for low deposit borrowers is very small. At the time of recording, 10% of their funds can go to low deposit purchases. And breaching these levels leads to eye-watering fines for the banks, so they tend to keep it well below 10% just in case. So, how do you get a mortgage with less than 20% deposit? To be in the running, you need to prove that you are an above average client and above average clients have good income and control all of their expenses. It all comes down to how much money is left over in your savings account at the end of the month. Someone with a 20% deposit might only need to cover the mortgage and their expenses from their income, but the same person with a 10% deposit might need to cover their mortgage expenses and have $500 or more left over in their account at the end of the month. In other words, they need to earn more than a 20% deposit borrower. This kind of makes sense if you think about it. The worst thing that can happen to a bank who has lent money to someone is that that person doesn't pay them back. If the bank only needs to sell a house for 80% of its value, they're likely to be able to do that. But if they've lent up to 90% of the value of the house, their risk of not getting all their money back is higher. So they only want people who are less likely to default. That means higher income earners. It's not great for people struggling to get onto the property ladder, but the banks need to protect themselves from defaults, and that's the way they choose to do it. 
Something else to know is that when banks are running out of money for their low deposit borrowers, they tend to prioritize their own existing clients first. They don't really want to be turning down their own clients down for mortgages. The policy for this can change from day to day, but one takeaway from it is that if you are a couple, it's good practice to bank at different banks. If you do, you'll double your odds of getting a mortgage if both banks are a bit tight on funds. Typically, the criteria for being a client of the banks is that your salary has been, been deposited regularly into an account at the bank for more than three months. And finally, how can you purchase a house with just 5% deposit? Are we back to the Wild West days of lending of 2008? Not quite. Kainga Ora, the government department formerly known as Housing New Zealand, backs the First Home Loan Scheme, a lending scheme that allows first home buyers to borrow up to 95% of a property if they meet certain criteria. This is very much aimed at the lower end of the market and the scheme has caps on how much you can earn and price caps on how much you can buy. It's worth checking out the thresholds to see if you meet the criteria. One tip I've got for you is that the income threshold or income cap is based on what you earned in the last 12 months as a household, not what you are currently earning. So one of you might have just come back from maternity leave, you may meet the criteria when in reality, you are earning above the threshold. There are also several developers who specialize in building homes at the Kainga Ora price threshold. Typically, these are townhouses with adjoining walls, but on the whole are still very nice homes for the first step onto the property ladder. And that wraps up all the info you need on a deposit. The key numbers are 20% deposit is great, 10 to 20% deposit is achievable, and 5 to 10% deposit is possible with the help of Kainga Ora. Thank you for watching. I'm Rupert Goff. See you again soon. Thank you.